Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Cindy James? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the death, then offer my analysis. Cynthia Elizabeth James was born in Oliver, British Columbia, Canada, on June 12, 1944. She went by the name Cindy. Her father was an English teacher and had served as a colonel in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Her mother was a homemaker. Cindy had three older brothers and two younger sisters. In diary entries made by Cindy, she claimed that her father was strict and used to physically strike her. Cindy went to high school in Ottawa, Canada. In 1962, she enrolled in nursing school in Vancouver. Around this time, her father re-enlisted in the Air Force, and the family moved to France. Cindy remained in Vancouver to continue her studies. She occasionally sent letters to the family, in which she talked about a male romantic partner who she met in nursing school. Cindy never revealed the name of the man, and nobody in Cindy's family ever met him. She indicated that she and the man became engaged, but then the man developed terminal cancer. The couple went on a skiing trip where the man brought an end to his own life. Cindy graduated with a bachelor's degree in nursing in July 1966. She found a job at Vancouver General Hospital as a pediatric nurse. The year before, Cindy met a South African psychiatrist named Roy Makepeace, who worked as an assistant professor at a college in British Columbia. Roy was 18 years older than Cindy. The couple married on December 9, 1966. Cindy's parents were not thrilled about this outcome. They felt as though Roy was manipulative and took advantage of their gullible daughter. It didn't appear as though Cindy was too happy either. She would later say that Roy mistreated her. In 1975, Cindy took a job as a team coordinator at a mental health facility for children. In June 1982, after several tumultuous years in her relationship with her husband, Cindy and Roy separated. In September of 1982, Cindy told family members and friends that she believed that someone was lurking around her house, like there was some type of prowler who was watching her. This would be the first of many mysterious reports from Cindy. Not long after this, Cindy claimed that she was receiving disturbing phone calls Sometimes the caller would remain silent. At other times, they would speak in different voices. Some of the content was violent and sexual in nature. The first call was allegedly received on October 7. Cindy reported that she received another call on October 11, during which the caller said, quote, I'll get you one night, Cindy, unquote, and made loud breathing noises. Cindy reported the calls to the police. They visited her on October 12. Their advice was to get an unlisted number and to keep a log of the calls containing what the caller said. It sounds like they didn't have a lot of faith in the unlisted number tactic, or else the call log would have been unnecessary. Cindy claimed that right after the police left, she received another threatening call. The next day, October 13, Cindy allegedly received another call, during which the caller asked her if she thought contacting the police would keep her safe. Cindy continued to contact the police with various reports over the next few days. She said that she heard someone outside her home and found her porch lights had been broken and someone threw a rock through one of her windows and made entry into her house. Cindy said that on October 19, an intruder had slashed a pillow on her bed. The police couldn't figure out the motive for this pillow homicide. Was it pillow talk gone bad. They thought that perhaps Cindy's former lover, Roy Makepeace, had something against the pillow. Maybe Roy wasn't interested in making peace after all. Cindy told the police that she didn't think Roy was capable of these crimes, but she told acquaintances that he was violent. The police spoke to Roy. He denied any involvement. Around this time, the basement of Cindy's house was occupied by two tenants. They told the police that on October 20, they heard strange noises coming from the first floor. Cindy was not in the house. She had already left for work. The police spoke to a neighbor who said that she observed a man standing outside 
of Cindy's house on at least three occasions. One time, the man walked through the gate in the front yard. The person the neighbor described did not look like Roy Makepeace. One of the police officers who was investigating the case was a man named Patrick McBride. Patrick started a romantic relationship with Cindy and moved into her house on October 31, 1982. This was right after the series of suspicious incidents were reported. A few days after moving in, Patrick found Roy in a vehicle in the alley behind Cindy's house. Roy explained his behavior by saying he was trying to catch the stalker in the act. Patrick and Roy eventually became kind of friendly with each other. They were both fascinated with finding the stalker. It was frequently the topic of conversations between them. In mid-November, Patrick claimed that he received a strange call at Cindy's house while Cindy was there. The caller didn't say anything. The call was traced back to a currency exchange business in a Vancouver suburb called Richmond. A few days later, Cindy claimed that she found a note on her windshield depicting a dead body. On November 28, Patrick found that the phone lines to Cindy's house had been cut. Three days later, Patrick moved out of the house although he continued his romantic relationship with Cindy for about a year. Near Christmas, Cindy said that she found a note outside her house. It featured a woman with her throat slashed and had a message, which read, Merry Christmas. On January 27, 1983, a friend and co-worker of Cindy named Agnes visited Cindy's house. Agnes found Cindy unconscious in the backyard. There was a nylon stocking wrapped around her neck, After regaining consciousness, Cindy explained that she had been attacked by two assailants while walking to her exterior garage. They threatened to kill her sister if she told the police. The incident was reported to the police, but they were skeptical about Cindy's story and recommended that she receive mental health counseling. On February 1, just five days after this alleged attack, Cindy moved to a house in West Vancouver. She claimed that she received another threatening letter and more phone calls. She moved to another house in April. In August 1983, after returning from a trip to Indonesia, Cindy claimed that she found another threatening note. Cindy hired a private investigator named Ozzy Kaban to catch the stalker. Cindy took a number of other measures to protect herself. She carried a two-way radio to communicate with Ozzy, repainted her car, in a different color, wore a portable panic button, and carried pepper spray. Over the next few months, Cindy continued to report incidents, like finding dead cats in her garden and receiving threatening calls at home and at work. On January 30, 1984, Ozzy responded to Cindy's house after hearing bizarre noises over the two-way radio. He found Cindy unconscious on the living room floor. There was a note pinned to her hand with a knife. The note read, now you must die, blank. The blank was a vulgar word for female genitals. Cindy was transported to a hospital. She claimed that she had been attacked by a man who injected her with a needle. The police could not find a needle mark on her arm. On June 18, 1984, Ozzy made his way to Cindy's house after she called him on the phone. He found her hiding in the garden. She told him that there was an intruder in the house. Ozzy investigated. He found Cindy's dog in the basement. The dog had been physically mistreated. Ozzy also found a disturbing note and a cigarette butt, which did not match the kind of cigarettes that Cindy smoked. Over the next few weeks, Cindy continued to report incidents, for example, threatening phone calls, a dead cat in her house, fake police officers confronting her, and someone ringing the doorbell in the middle of the night and breaking a window. The last incident was witnessed by Cindy and her mother, who was spending the night at her house. On July 23, 1984, Cindy once again said that she was attacked, this time at a park at 8.30 p.m. A few hours later, she was found by a neighbor with a nylon stocking around her neck. She was taken to a hospital. The police found puncture wounds in her right arm. After this alleged attack, Cindy reported more threatening phone calls. Almost a year later, in June 1985, Cindy was admitted to a mental health facility. Her participation in treatment was involuntary. After being released, 
Cindy continued to report incidents, like disturbing notes, raw meat being left on her front porch, and fires in her house. The third report of a fire was on October 21 at 4.45 a.m. The police found Cindy's behavior to be suspicious. She said that she had taken her dog for a walk at 3.15 a.m. and returned to find the house on fire. The bathroom window was open a little bit, but none of the dust on the windowsill had been disturbed. The police concluded that Cindy set the fire. Cindy moved to a new house on December 1. On December 11, she was found in a ditch in a state of confusion. There was a nylon stocking around her neck. She was taken to the hospital. She said that she had no memory of what happened. In 1986, Cindy changed her last name to James. She was hoping this would keep her safe from the mysterious stalker. On April 16, Cindy reported another fire, this one in her basement. Her friend Agnes and her husband Tom were at Cindy's house when the fire started. Tom said he saw a man on the street outside the house. In August of 1987, Cindy took a new job as a nurse at a hospital. Toward the end of that month and in early September, Cindy reported a number of incidents, for example, windows being broken and light bulbs being unscrewed on her porch. In February 1988, she reported that someone broke a window in her house. In October of that same year, Roy Makepeace received two messages on his answering machine which were threatening towards Cindy. On October 26, Cindy was once again found unconscious with a nylon stocking around her neck. This time she was in her garage. On April 8, 1989, a security guard at the hospital where Cindy worked found a note threatening to Cindy. On April 29, Cindy reported that someone broke into her house. The police investigated and found nothing. Cindy made a similar report on May 10. Now moving to the timeline of the death. On May 25, 1989, Cindy James picked up her paycheck from the hospital where she worked. She went to a bank and deposited the check at 7.59 p.m. Cindy never arrived at her house, and friends reported her missing. The police found her 1981 Chevrolet Citation in a shopping center parking lot. There was blood on the vehicle. On June 8, a municipal worker found Cindy's body in the backyard of an abandoned house in Richmond. There was a black nylon stocking around her neck, and she was tied with rope. Cindy's cause of death was an overdose of morphine and benzodiazepines. She had ingested at least some of the drugs orally, maybe all of them. The manner of her death was undetermined. The police believe that Cindy took the drugs, tied herself up, and died. Her family members believed that she was murdered. An expert in tying knots concluded that Cindy could have tied the knots around her own wrists and ankles. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, from 1982 until her death in 1989, Cindy James reported about 100 incidents to the police. The cost to investigate was well over a million dollars. The police found no convincing evidence that anyone was involved in the mysterious incidents other than Cindy. I find it amazing that Cindy was averaging about an incident per month for years, yet the police did not maintain continuous surveillance. It would have been expensive to have an officer watch her house all the time, even just at night, but the police could have installed cameras. At least that way they could have solved the mystery. The next time Cindy reported a broken window or an unscrewed porch light, the police would have known that she was responsible. Item number two, Cindy appeared to have a number of mental health symptoms. After one of the fires in October 1985, the police arranged for a mental health professional to perform an assessment on Cindy. The clinician said that Cindy might have dissociative identity disorder and she was lying about everything. She had never been attacked. Many mental health researchers doubt the existence of this particular disorder, but either way, the clinician thought that Cindy was being deceptive. After the fire in April 1986, Cindy was once again evaluated by a clinician. The report indicated that Cindy was friendly, unpredictable, pessimistic, and negative. She kept asking if her responses to questions indicated that she was mentally ill. 
After Cindy's death, a few mental health professionals assigned various diagnoses, including histrionic and borderline personality disorders, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Item number three. One time when Cindy was under hypnosis, she claimed that in 1981, while she and her ex-husband Roy were on a vacation at a cabin northwest of Vancouver, Roy murdered two people. The police investigated. There were no reports of murders or missing people in the area at that time. The police couldn't even find the cabin that Cindy described. It seems clear that Cindy was trying to frame Roy for these fictitious murders. She wanted people to believe that he was dangerous. Now moving to my final item, number four. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Cindy James had a desire to be the center of attention, had a fear of abandonment, and a willingness to harm herself. This is a dangerous combination. After Cindy James separated from Roy Makepeace, she wanted to get revenge on him. Therefore, she started fabricating stories about a mysterious stalker. Cindy may have had some help with her scam. Perhaps she paid somebody to make some of the phone calls to her house, but largely she staged all the scenes herself. The alleged incidents were not believable. Why would a stalker unscrew a light bulb on a porch, break a window, set small fires, or repeatedly attempt to strangle the same victim? The perpetrator managed to escape every time and never left behind any physical evidence that could be used to identify him. There were witnesses who saw suspicious people and heard noises, but they were probably responding to a perceived threat combined with their belief that Cindy was telling the truth. They were highly attentive to suspicious behavior in that moment. They were misinterpreting the different stimuli that they were seeing and hearing. On many occasions, the police thought that perhaps Cindy was lying, but she was attractive and was afforded more consideration than usual. In addition, she was willing to cause herself physical harm. Some of the police officers couldn't understand why anyone would do that to themselves. If Cindy really was the victim of a perpetrator, she would have never tolerated the number of attacks involved. She ended up with a nylon stocking around her neck several times. For most people, one or two times would be enough to move away from the area or to take drastic safety measures, like always living with other people and never going anywhere alone. In addition, it's incredible that all these attacks occurred, yet Cindy never supplied any useful description of an attacker. If there really was a perpetrator, this man had a lot of spare time and managed to get away with about 100 crimes, many of which were felonies. He would be among the greatest criminal masterminds who ever lived. With this in mind, one could argue that Cindy James deserves this title, except she was both the perpetrator and the victim. She was her own worst enemy, and essentially tortured herself for seven years. Cindy James manipulated people through a pronounced expression of vulnerable narcissism and histrionic personality. The police reinforced her behavior for years and became unwitting accomplices in her fraud and in her suffering. Those are my thoughts on the case of Cindy James. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.